Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to Triggered Precision Machine. Thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to stick with the topic of precision rifle reloading and we're going to look at the load development process that I use to load for all of my precision rifles. I have to give credit where credit is due. The inventor of this method is a guy named Dan Newberry. I'll post a link to his website at the bottom of the video so you guys can check it out. He does a very good job of explaining the process in details and he gets into why it works and kind of the methodology behind the system. So I'll give you guys a brief overview and I have a target right here that we'll put up on the screen in a second and we'll go through and interpret the results together so you can kind of get a feel for how it works. To start this method, we need an accurate rifle that is capable of minute of angle or better accuracy and we need good quality hand loads. It'll make a lot more sense when we start looking at the target why we need that kind of accuracy, but in general, it helps us interpret the results a little bit more effectively. After we have our cartridge case selected, our bullet selected, and our powder and primer selected, then we gotta go in and we have to find our max and our minimum loads. And I do that using a powder manufacturer's reloading book. So I use Hodgson powders pretty much exclusively. So I refer to their book for the max load. And generally speaking, they're pretty close. It can vary according to the case volume and your bullet seating depth on your particular cartridge. And just a reminder, we always have to exercise caution when we're doing this initial load development and determining the pressure limits of our cartridge case. So after we have our components set and we decided on a max powder charge, the next step is to determine a starting point. We take our max powder charge, we subtract between seven and 10%, and then that is our starting point for the whole test. At that starting point, we're gonna load one cartridge, we're gonna increase our powder charge 1%, load one cartridge there, and once again, increase at 1%, load one cartridge there. So we have three cartridges loaded, which end up being 2% higher than our initial starting point. From there, we take our last powder charge and we add 0.7 to 1% to that number. And that gives us our first series in the optimal charge weight test. I use the variance that I just mentioned, the 0.7 to 1% to modify the test for different cartridges that I shoot. So the larger case capacity cartridges, like the 300 Norma, where you're loading 80 to 90 grains of powder, I usually venture more towards the smaller side of things, more towards the 0.7% increase. And on the smaller cases, like the 223, the 6.5 Creedmoor class, 308 class, I usually vary more in the 1% range as I increase my powder charges. So after we have our first series loaded, we increase once again 0.7 to 1%. And we repeat this, loading three cartridges each time until we just go past our max. And one thing to remember is the max number that we use for our powder charge usually comes out of reloading book unless we have previous experience with this cartridge and these same components. So use caution when we're actually in the process of shooting these and we'll get into that more in a separate video. As I mentioned before, we wanna have a clean barrel on the day that we shoot this test. It isn't necessary to strip all of the copper out of the barrel, but it is necessary to have a reasonably clean barrel to start this test. One other thing to note is it's important to use a target, kinda of like this one, that has a very fine aiming point. That just helps with the consistency and the accuracy that you can find with having a consistent reticle position on the target so we can develop a pattern by where the shots are landing on the target. So after we're all set up, we have our good shooting position built, our nice target is down at 100 yards, and we're ready to go. We take those first three loads that we loaded that were seven to 10% below our max, and those are used as fowlers to season the barrel in this test. So we fire each of those in ascending order, and generally speaking, I like to wait two to three minutes between rounds but for these first three fowlers, unless your barrel is getting very hot, you're shooting one of the large case capacity cartridges where the heat builds up rather quickly, you don't have to worry about waiting in between shots for these three. However, after you fire the third shot, I would recommend waiting between three and five minutes. You never wanna let your barrel get hotter than when you can put your hand on it and let your hand stay on the barrel for an extended period of time, if that makes sense. And after we fired our three fowler rounds, we get to start the test. We find the lowest charge weight series that we loaded. So there's gonna be three identical rounds in that series. We take one of those rounds, we fire that at a new point of aim on our target. So it's important to note 
which target you're shooting at on your target sheet, I use how we read. So we read left to right, top to bottom. So I start at the top left of the target, work my way to the right, and then I work down from there. You can mark the targets as well with the different charge weights before you put the target up, and that also helps to keep track of which target you're shooting on. So we shoot one of those cartridges from that first series. After we do that, we let our rifle barrel cool a predetermined amount of time. I usually just set the timer between two and three minutes. And then we proceed to the next, the subsequent higher series. So that's gonna be that 0.7 to 1% higher than that first series. And we fire one cartridge from that on another point of aim on our target. So we continue this all the way up until we get to our max powder charge. And once again, be careful when we're approaching the max and look for the pressure signs, just remain safe. So after we've completed one full round of shooting one cartridge from each series, then we go back to the lowest series and we shoot the second round from that series on the same target, same point of aim that we shot our first round on. So essentially, we're gonna have all three rounds shot at the same target from the same series. We just don't shoot the same series all at once. We rotate through the series in an ascending order until we finish, we loop back around to the bottom and we start that again until we fired all three rounds from each series and we have our three impacts on all of our individual point of aims on our target. So as we're shooting our test, we wanna pay attention to a few things. First off, the environment. We wanna make sure that some wind didn't kick up or something that's gonna skew the results of our test. And next, like I mentioned before, pay attention to your chronograph and pay attention to the signs that your rifle is showing you. So that heavy bolt lift, if you reach a heavy bolt lift or you show signs of excessive pressure prior to reaching your max cartridge, stop right there. Don't go any further, it's not worth it. And we're not out here chasing velocity for this test, we're out here chasing consistency and accuracy. So before we move on and look at a target, it's worth taking a second to talk about why this system works. So every time we fire a round through our rifle, the bullet obviously goes down the barrel and exits the muzzle. In addition to this, there's a harmonic frequency that travels the length of the barrel as well. And once it hits the muzzle end, it reflects back to the breech end of the barrel, and then it keeps on reflecting back and forth until it dissipates. So it does this at a very, very fast rate and at some point of the harmonic frequencies travel, the bullet is exiting the muzzle. So what this system does is it finds the point of lowest harmonic frequency at the muzzle end that coincides with the bullet's exit. So theoretically, this gives us these more consistent pressure tolerant groups. So it sounds very technical, and it is. We're talking about harmonic frequencies and stuff, and a lot of people don't even realize that this plays a significant role and squeezing out every last bit of accuracy from our rifles. So now I'll throw the target that I shot last weekend up on the screen and we'll go through it and show you how to interpret the results. All right, we have our nice OCW target up on the screen now. Just one thing I wanted to point out before we get started, and that is I shot this target in descending powder charge weight order. So I started with the 85 grain target up in the upper left hand corner, and I ended with the 82.6 grain target in the lower left hand corner. And my reasoning for doing this was simply, this is what order the cartridges were in my ammo box. And I'm also very familiar with this cartridge and I know its pressure limitations. It's worth noting that I would never do this on a first time OCW where I had yet to determine the pressure limitations of a cartridge. One other thing, if you notice, there's five bullet holes in each target instead of the three. So I did that because I have 25 rounds of fire formed brass and I'm trying to keep them all together. You can shoot more than the three rounds, but just be aware that you're introducing the potential for greater human error the more rounds that you shoot. But I have found that it doesn't change the results of the test, and it's nice in case you have a flyer or something that you call during the process, you have extra rounds to make up for it. Starting up here with the 85 grain load, we have a group measurement center to center of 0.468 for those five rounds and an average velocity of 2926 feet per second. Moving over to the right, we have our 84.4 grain load measuring 0.858 center to center. And you can see that there's that one little flyer out there. And we'll talk about that in a second. And the average speed for that is 2870 feet per second. 
Then moving down to the middle left, we have 83.8 grains. That is a 1.1 inch group, so that's a, a pretty wide group, and Dan Newberry calls that a scatter node. And average group, our average speed for that group is 2873. And moving to the right center, we have our 83.2 grain load at 0.497 inches center to center with 2850 feet per second. And finally, the bottom left measures 0.866 and has an average velocity of 2830. And we can disregard that target on the bottom right that was not used in this test. It's also worth noting that you could have more powder charges than what I have here, the five, in your particular OCW test. So I try to keep this test under 25 rounds. So you could have up to eight series of three rounds if you really wanted to. So now we get into how to interpret the results of this test. So this test was shot to the best of my ability. It was shot through an accurate, proven rifle. So I trust the results of this test. So starting with the 85 grain load, what we want to do is we want to find roughly where the center average of the group is. So if you see the cursor on the top left target, I would call where that's circling the center average of that group. Okay, we'll put a little dot there. So we move to the right, we have our 84.4 group, and that is obviously a lot lower. So it kicks off at the seven o'clock direction and goes low, and then we have that one flyer up the two o'clock direction that's high. So we'll kind of weight that group to right around here. And that should be the center of that. Moving to the center left at 83.8, this is a scatter node. These are a little bit harder to determine the center, but just do your best. So we start to see the center of the group come back towards the bottom middle of the target, right where the cursor is. And jumping over to 83.2, we have another group that's kind of centered up in the bottom third half, middle of the target here. And I would say that our center is probably somewhere right around there. And jumping down to our last target on the low left, we can see that we're still right there in the bottom third of the target, kind of in the middle. So I would say that our center is probably somewhere right around there. So when I'm doing this, I'll take a marker and I'll actually mark out or triangulate where I find the center of the group to be. And it makes it easier to, easier to interpret the results. So we can interpret the results by looking at these. The groups are all pretty consistent, except for this scatter node right here. So what we're looking for is the point of impact in relation to our point of aim for each of these targets. So as you can see, we have this point of impact over here to the bottom right. Then our point of impact takes a shift. It's just six tenths of a grain less, and it shifts exactly six o'clock below our point of aim. And then we go down six tenths more, and our group opens up to over double what our first group at 85 grains was. So there's some movement that's occurring, and that's all in relation to that harmonic wave that travels down the barrel during the shot cycle. And as we move over to the 83.2 grain load, we notice our average point of impact there in the low middle center is pretty equivalent to the 83.8 grain load, which is the next powder charge up. So as we look at the last three targets, we notice that the point of impact is very similar for all three. So it's down here in the lower third of the target, pretty much in the center. What that tells us is we have found a load that coincides with a low spot in the harmonic frequency of our barrel. So the bullet is exiting during an optimal time during the harmonic frequency. So most importantly, what this target tells us is our 83.2 grain charge is going to be very resilient, pressure tolerant, and forgiving. So if we look to the charge weights above and below 83.2 grains, we have a very similar point of impact, which tells me if we have an increase or decrease in pressure due to environmental factors or possibly a change in components, that at least our point of impact is going to be in the same area. Our group size might open up as you see in the 83.8 grain load, but our POI will remain the same. And before we move on, we'll run through a quick recap. After we shoot our groups, we go through and we determine the average point of impact for each group in relation to the point of aim. Then we compare those points and we find three sequential charge weights, ideally, 
that have similar points of impact, like we do with 83.8, 83.2, and 82.6. And that tells us that we've located our optimal charge weight where the bullet is exiting the muzzle at a point of low harmonic oscillation. So this is a lot to digest. It sounds very complex, but in reality, this is a pretty simple system once you go through it a few times. And once again, I'll post the link to Dan Newberry's website so you can read through all the information at your own leisure. And it might make more sense once you read through it on your own. But I've used this for several years and I've never had it fail me yet. It's pretty easy to interpret the results. You just have to make sure that you have a rifle that's capable of actually shooting the groups and something that will make a consistent pattern that you can interpret later on. So Dan preaches to not pay attention to group size during this test, and I've followed his methodology to the T before, and it always seems to work. So oftentimes our optimal charge weight group might not have a group as nice as this. It might open up to like this 0.866 inch center to center group. And according to Dan, that's not something to worry about at this time, because all we're doing for this test is we're looking for pressure tolerance. So after we find that load that's in the middle of three different series, then we know we have a pressure tolerant load. And from there, we can tweak things in the load, such as seating depth, to dial in our accuracy a little bit better or shrink our group size. So guys, I hope that was informative, but hopefully you guys take a look at Dan Newberry's website and get a better feel for it and put this to use and in your own reloading because it, it helps a lot and it helps streamline the process and it doesn't take a whole lot of rounds or effort to run this test. That's it for today. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you like what you're seeing, hit the like and subscribe button, and we'll keep the content going. We'll see you next time.